welcome everyone once more to our Institute Encounters in which we uh, interview uh, the very interesting guests who are brought to speak here at Texas Tech uh, under the aegis of the Institute for the Study of Western Civilization. Our guest today is Professor Tonio Andre of Emory University, uh, a very interesting scholar who does something uh, that uh, of, of a kind that much more should be done. That is to say, he compares the East and the West. He compares Western civilization and, uh, in this case, Chinese civilization with respect to military history. Um, he is the author of a fascinating book, uh, not only in terms of its content, but in terms of its readability, a real page Turner called The Lost Colony, uh, and The Lost Colony is the story of um, uh, the Sino-Dutch War of 1661-1662. Uh, you might ask, what would lead one to examine closely uh, this relatively uh, obscure military conflict? But there is a very good reason to examine it. Uh, and to find out what that is, uh, let me turn to Professor Andre and ask uh, why you decided to write a book about this particular engagement. Well, the Sino-Dutch War was the first major military confrontation between the Chinese and the Westerners before the Opium War. And so it's just extremely important. You know, we, we don't really have other examples until then. Um, there was a minor conflagration between the Portuguese and the Chinese in the 1500s, but, uh, but nothing like this. So this was a, the first major war. Um, and as I started researching it, I just found that first there was enormous amounts of material on it, and there was wonderfully colorful material, and so I, I decided it was worth the book and, and decided to, to write it. But you thought of it as kind of a uh, experiment, historical experiment, in which you could test a proposition that otherwise couldn't be that easily tested. And, and what was that proposition? Right. The, the question is, um, is how, how powerful were the Europeans at that period in time? I mean, of course, during the Opium War in the 1800s, they had advanced steamships and advanced industrial produced cannon and things like that. And so the British victory uh, then was, uh, you know, almost a foregone conclusion. Um, but in the 1600s, many people argued that the Europeans had a military advantage over people in the rest of the world, and that that advantage was one of the things that allowed them to create these colonies all over the world. Um, and so this is one of the few places where we can actually test that um, by seeing the Europeans, the Dutch in this case, go up against a, a sort of Asian army, um, an Asian navy. And so, it, it, yeah, it's a, it's a way to test some of these these bigger questions about about parity and uh, and and uh, yeah, who had better weapons and better tactics and, and better logistics and all that stuff. How did the war begin? Well, the war started. The Dutch had a colony on Taiwan, and the war started. They had this the colony from about, about uh, 1624 or so, and they started. Uh, it was a very prosperous colony, one of the most important colonies in the uh, Dutch East India Companies vast empire. Um, but across the straits in mainland China, there was a, a great dynastic transition from the, between the Ming and the Qing. And uh, the Ming dynasty, it fell, technically we consider the fall of the Ming to be 1644, but of course people were fighting to restore it. And one of these people fighting to restore it uh, decided that he wanted to take over Taiwan from the Dutch um, as a good base from which to continue the, the fight. And so he he had vast armies, uh, at least 150,000 men, probably more than that. Um, and the Dutch had far fewer, and he decided to, to invade. It was the biggest invasion, maritime, overseas maritime expedition in Chinese history since the, uh, the famous expeditions of Zheng He, the, the, you know, the Chinese Columbus with 25,000 men going across across the Indian Ocean. Was he thinking a little like Chiang Kai-shek would later on? He needed an offshore bastion to... Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the, the parallels are crazy, uh -huh. yeah. It's very similar. So, uh, he he attacks the, the Dutch, mm -hmm. and um, what you wanted to see was uh, how the two sides arrayed against each other, stacked up in terms of proficiency of weapons and tactics and whatever. 
uh, what happens? Well, I mean, the first thing to keep in mind is that the Chinese outnumber the Dutch enormously. Um, the second thing is that we know at the end that the Chinese won. Um, and so we have to really look in detail at the battles and the, you know, the actual engagements to, to get at this question of, of military abilities, you know, uh, comparisons. Um, and so uh, people who have argued that Europeans have a military advantage say that it rests on four things, basically. They had better guns, supposedly. They had uh, better tactics. They were able to use these guns better, organizing human beings to fight in, for, in formations, especially with muskets fighting, firing in turns. Um, uh, the third thing is better ships, and the fourth thing is better fortresses. And so what I found is that uh, um, there were a bunch of battles. I mean, we could go into specific battles and stuff, but I'll just give the overview first. In, in general, uh, on land, the Chinese were far more effective. They, they were as disciplined as or better disciplined than the, than the Dutch. Um, their guns were as good or better, um, certainly as good. Um, and they were Chinese-made guns. And they were, Chinese, yeah, so they had some Western guns, but they also had their own guns that they uh, were making themselves. Um, and they were very effective. Um, but on the oceans and deep water combat, the Dutch ships were yeah, extraordinarily effective and could stand up to far larger numbers of Chinese ships. Now the Chinese ships, well, in using the term ship, I guess, is they, they were ships, I guess, but they were smaller, much smaller, and they were often used for sort of coastal and maritime, uh, coastal and riverine uh, warfare, because they were fighting a war primarily against a, a land power um, before they attacked the Dutch. Um, but in any case, these, these uh, European ships could stand up to 10 or 20 easily of the Chinese, uh, Chinese ships. Except they, they were bigger and more strongly constructed. They were, yeah, and filled with cannons. Mm -hmm. Like they broadside cannons, mm -hmm. so say, you know, could levy twenty guns or so and blast, <laughs> blast anything mm -hmm. to bits. Um, and the Chinese ships had cannons, and they were cannon. There were cannon ships, but they had fewer, and and they, you know, couldn't do the massive broadsides that the Europeans could. So in that sense, in, in terms of naval battles, as long as it was in deep water, uh, I think that the 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 idea that Europeans had an advantage is, is pretty clear, but of course they could always the Chinese could always lead them to shallow water, and then they had other types of vessels that were enormously effective too um, uh, for shallow water combat and that kind of. So I mean, they were proficient to... using fire ships, if I recall. Yeah, and also yeah, exactly loading like bombs, basically mm -hmm. floating bombs. They were good at that too. Um, but so yeah, I think that the ships is one example, and uh, another thing that that the Dutch had was a Renaissance fortress. This this fascinating design that uh, uh, Leonardo da Vinci and others like would design these fortresses that had angled bastions on the end, and that this is a famous thing in, in European military history. Uh, and the Dutch had one of these on Taiwan, and it was enormously effective. The Chinese didn't quite understand how to take it. They tried various things, very smart things they tried, but ultimately um, it wasn't until they had a, the help of a, a drunken German defector who, who was a Catholic and the Dutch were uh, uh -huh. Protestant and he got sick of not having enough alcohol, maybe or uh -huh. alcohol got very expensive in Fort. I don't know why he went over, but he went over to the Chinese and taught them basically how to set up siege works on, on the European uh, line, massive, uh, yeah, Batteries all sort of fortified and in lines, and, and then in that way they managed to to force a Dutch surrender after about nine months of, of warfare. So, um, so in some sense, I think that the the Dutch, the, the European reputation for military effectiveness is deserved. But at the same time, um, we have to see, I think, this this age of the 1600s and the 1700s as a time of very rapid Chinese adaptation in the warfare in that period in the 17th century, they were uh, they were making enormous strides. We can't think of China as a kind of static place at all. That that comes a bit later, militarily static. They were static later, but not during this very dynamic period. Um, so these findings, uh, even though they're quite nuanced and they look at different dimensions of the conflict and make different judgments with respect to them, nonetheless, 
uh, sort of fly in the face of, of, of a lot of the understandings, even among military historians, mm. about the, the relative proficiencies uh, and technological effectiveness of, of the East and West. What, um, what therefore, what, what's been the reception of, of, of the book? Well, generally, people have been pretty positive about it. Um, yeah, I mean, most reviews have been have been quite good, and and I think most gratifying for me is that people who might not have no, normally read about this sort of thing, a lot of people have picked up the book and found it interesting. I mean, I tried to write it in a way that was that was fun, you know, because it was the, the sources are so great. There's so many great characters, you know, uh, gay pirates and things like that. Um, that it was just it was it was so fun to write. So I'm glad that people are are picking it up. Yeah, but the in terms of critical reception. Really, I think that the general conclusions are accepted. Some people have said that I overrate the Chinese. Um, one guy in particular said that, but then he he didn't read the Chinese sources, so I, I don't I don't know that he can really make that case. Um, and other people have suggested that um, that when I say that uh, the Europeans had superior ships or superior forts, what I should be saying is that they had different ships and different forts. Um, and there's a case to be made for that, but but I I do think that in certain cases, like you can really compare, you know, when it comes to warfare, uh, when Dutch ships were able to single-handedly or single-shippedly, I guess you could say, single-shippedly take on vast numbers of other ships, uh, that you can talk about superiority in, in these terms. And the fortress, I think, definitely deserves. They were also able to sail into the wind. Back yes, the this is another right. thing I didn't say. Yeah, it's a mm -hmm. it's a very interesting thing that they had rigging that allowed them to sail much closer to the wind than the than the uh, Chinese junks, which makes sense because the Chinese junks were designed to sail with the monsoon. It's very predictable wind patterns, and you just went one way one season, went back the other way the other season, and in the Atlantic, you know, with the, the Dutch had to get through the very difficult Atlantic half of the half of a Dutch voyage to all the way to the East Indies was spent in the Atlantic. It was a very difficult ocean and you had to be able to sail all sorts of different conditions. And so anyway, that yeah, the, the Chinese commander is, is surprised when the Dutch relief fleet shows up, even though it's 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 sailing into contrary winds. Exactly, yeah. Well, the the, dis, the Dutch managed to send word. He The, the Chinese um, general, the Chinese commander, timed his invasion so that it would happen in the spring just after the monsoon winds changed from a northern wind that would allow you to go to south to where the Dutch had their main port, um, to uh, the very far south, right, to their main uh, center besides Taiwan and uh, Java. Um, he timed it so that so that he thought that they wouldn't be able to send words because the contrary winds would be coming. Um, but they managed to send a dispatch yacht and along a circuitous route through the Philippines and they, they managed to make it. And so when that, Philip, when that relief fleet arrived with, you know, thousand men or so and all sorts of food that he was all the Chinese were shocked and they, they didn't believe at first that it had come for them and there's other occasions in which this uh, sailing against the wind became important. Do the sources I mean we talk about how the contemporary historians uh, have looked too simply um, at the comparison of, of East and West during this mm -hmm. period how did the people at the time uh, perceive the other side. I mean, the, the, the Chinese, the, the Chinese commander is this fellow Kak Sing up, and what's, what's his Chinese name? Zheng Cheng Gong. Okay, and Kak Sing is kind of a uh, barbarization uh, that the, 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 the Dutch and, and Europeans used to refer to him. Yeah, his, he was also known, his favorite title was uh, Guo, Xing, Guo Xing Ye, which is the, the um, sort of father of the imperial surname, because he had been given by the emperor mm -hmm. the imperial surname. And in, in uh, the local dialect, the Fujianese dialect, it sounds something like Kok Sengya and then the So he's quite people. an extraordinary character. Yeah, he has a right. He has a Japanese mother and mm -hmm. a Chinese father is a warlord, sort of merchant prince warlord. As a pirate. Yeah. As a pirate as, yeah. as, as well. Um, and uh, he's a brilliant commander. I mean, he's certainly a far more capable commander than uh, Koyat. Was that his, yeah, that's his Dutch, right. Dutch counterpart. So, um, how does, uh, when, is it, do we have any uh, evidence of how he looked upon his adversaries in, in, in planning his operation or how he reacted? Uh, he's surprised at the fleet coming. Do we have some sense of what his estimation was of the military? Of the Dutch. Compared, you know, uh, before or during? Well, or before, after. during, and after, or whatever we, whatever we have. They thought it would be, the Chinese thought it would be a cakewalk. Uh -huh. um, they, uh, I mean, if we believe the sources, like obviously we have mm -hmm. only a certain number of sources, 
but uh, they thought that given how few uh, Dutchmen were there and how few soldiers they had relative to the 25,000 or so that they brought to bear in the very first wave that the Chinese brought to bear in the first wave, the Dutch had a oh, in, in thousand or so, right? 1,500 at first. Um, and uh, they thought it would be a cakewalk. So um, certainly they they were surprised at, at how the fortress was able to sort of massively defeat their first attempt to siege it, to besiege it, or to storm it. I mean, um, so in, in, I think that their estimation of the Dutch sort of increased at that point. But on the other hand, at the same time, the Dutch were losing foolish land battles. And so, you know, maybe in some senses, the, the Chinese were right. But what's, I think what's interesting about the, the, the Sino-Dutch relation during sort of the longer period, the decades that led up to the war, um, is, is how it changed. There were times when they were, there was a lot of friction. Um, and, and if you read the documents, the, especially the Dutch documents, talk about this, this nation of sodomizers and then how they're horrible people and stuff. But then, you know, once the, kind of, the conflict goes down, this is in the 1630s, early 1630s that happened. But by about 1635, they'd reached the modus vivendi and now they're buddies and they're trading all the time. You know? So you see kind of changes in the way they thought of each other. Certainly during wartime, the rhetoric got bad. There, was a, there were atrocities and torture on both sides. Um, uh, yeah. Did the, I mean, how did, did, did the Dutch know a good deal about China and the Chinese? And did the Chinese know very much about, about Holland? It, it's a good question. Um, some Dutch and some Chinese knew an enormous amount because they lived cheek by jowl mm -hmm. together in Taiwan. Taiwan had a very large, the Dutch Taiwan had a very large uh, Chinese population and the Dutch and the Chinese were did business together. They often went into deals together and um, the Chinese might put up capital, uh, the Dutch, you know, they would borrow from each other. So they, they knew each other quite well. They would have dinners, you know, there's inviting each other to dinner and things like that. Um, but I think the the higher up you went, at least on the Chinese side, the Dutch were much fewer and they were surrounded by many, many Chinese. Uh, on the Chinese side, the higher up you got, and, you know, and the less contact people had with the Dutch, it's easier to have sort of stereotypes about them. And they were, you know, the, the barbarians, the term, the characters used, or disparaging characters to refer to the Dutch, which is pretty typical. Did the, the Dutch have much insight into Chinese culture and the uh, Chinese regime? I'm, I'm not sure how to answer that. I, I don't, I mean, they weren't clueless by any means. I mean, certain times they didn't understand things. Uh, they didn't understand some basic ideas about the way that the, the, the Chinese imperium worked. Um, on the other hand, it's hard to say if, if, if it's that they didn't understand it or if they didn't accept it because the Chinese, they had this notion that all other peoples were, uh, not peoples necessarily, but all other states um, were, uh, less important, right? We're below the emperor. There is one emperor in the world, uh, and all other states are naturally below that, right? Um, and th that's just not a very European notion, and this, this kind of tension of, of the way that one looks at, at diplomacy and things. This, this is from the very beginning of the relation between Europe all the way through the Opium War and beyond. Um, so it's hard to say. People have said oh, Europeans didn't understand it. Well, maybe they understood it, but, you know, or, and, and Chinese, on the other hand, didn't understand Europeans. Maybe they both that's kind of understood, but they just, their systems were so different, there was no compatibility. Did the Dutch feel confident when they knew the attack was coming, or did they feel that this was going to be a struggle? No, they, they knew that it was, when they saw the ships, mm -hmm. an ocean of masts, I mean, a forest of masts on the, on the ocean, they, they were quite worried, mm -hmm. because they knew that was big. But on the other hand, they also knew when, when uh, Zhang Chen Gong began to set up his initial storming of the fortress, they, they weren't terrible. I mean, they were worried, obviously, but they also saw that there were some weaknesses, that, that it wasn't the way that you do, you know, you act to take a fortress like this. So yeah, there's, there was confidence in, and sometimes overconfidence. The Dutch tended to be sometimes overconfident and they had ridiculous uh, naval attacks where they brought their deep ships into a shallow bay and then gave all the advantage to the Chinese who completely outthought them. And, and Chinese leadership was, was often extraordinary, the military leadership. Was there, in, in Japan, at 
probably doesn't really begin until about a century later, but you have the development of this sort of Dutch learning mm. group, people who are very interested in the Dutch at Nagasaki yeah. uh, and are translating works from Dutch into Japanese. Um, during this period, does, does, I mean, there's not only the Dutch, but the, the Portuguese and the Jesuits in, in, in China. Uh, what what what's the uh, is there is there a parallel uh, phenomenon taking place in 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 China with respect to Western learning that you have in Japan? Um, yeah, I mean through the Jesuits, there's a lot of stuff going on, especially in the middle of the late Ming period, um, in the early Qing period. So the 1600s, late 1600s, and through this uh, middle of the 1600s, even actually till fairly late in the 1600s. There's the Chinese regimes of various types are pretty good about importing Western ideas and calendrical reforms based on mm -hmm. modern Galilean astro um, astronomy. Um, uh, yeah, so yeah, I, would, I guess you could say that there is a certain amount of that. I was going to say something else, but then I forgot. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, not, I, I gather that that the kind of work you've done is is relatively exceptional, uh, that there are not a lot of people in military history or in other areas of history who are trying to do the kind of point-by-point -point comparison uh, that in this particular case study mm -hmm. you work out. Is that, is that a fair assessment of, of how the field stands? I, I think actually that it's, it's a very exciting time for, mm -hmm. for military history. I think military history for so long was um, denigrated in the academy, and still to a certain extent is. Most history departments don't have a military historian. I wasn't trained as a military historian, I kind of became one later. Um, but the surge in interest in global history and world history, you know, history that goes beyond sort of national borders, and especially history that takes into account, like you're doing with your institute, to try to compare, you know, uh, Western civilization with, with other uh, civilizations or other. Uh, other societies, that this this kind of movement I think is opening up all sorts of new possibilities among military historians, and there's a bunch of them that are working in, on Asia. I mean, we, we know very little. I mean, I'm just going to say, like at this point, our our knowledge is very very slight. But there are some people, uh, on one of them, uh, people working on it. A guy named uh, Sun Lai Chen in California. A guy named Kenneth Swope. Um, there are all sorts of people working on it. Uh, not all sorts. A small group, but hopefully, but it's growing and it's very exciting what they're doing. On um, this kind of point by point, I guess a little bit, a little bit less, but there, there's a great interest in it. So I think that it's, it's one of those things that I think is set to expand. What, what kind of revelations has comparative military history uh, led to with respect to our knowledge of of, of how militaries evolve, mm -hmm. how military technology develops? What, what, what? broader patterns do you see when you look at the East and the West? I think one of the things that's, I mean, again, this is very much at the beginning of the movement. I mean, I, I may, may have been the first person to use the term global military history. Maybe not. It's a pretty obvious term, but but certainly it hasn't been used very much, and it's, it's, it's a very new thing. But I think one of the things is to... Uh, we have these um, this narrative, this model of Western history, um, in which the West is very dynamic, right? The idea is that after about 1500 or so, uh, the West was surging ahead, and, and um, depending on who you read, there's, a, there's an idea that uh, that Asia was stagnant or was was much less dynamic. And I think one of the things that that the, these people are showing in this new work, my work included, is that the dynamism in the East was much more than we thought. There were a lot of developments that were happening that uh, we wouldn't have really known about until we really started to study these things. Um, I'm working on a book now about uh, um, that really compares Chinese to Western military developments, focusing on the gun, called the Gunpowder Age, that, uh, that's looking at this, but other people are doing this stuff too. And it, it turns out that if, you, that, that if you kind of compare what we thought about was unique to Europe, we find a lot of analogs elsewhere. Um, and so I think that, that sense that there's much more dynamism going on, that the world, in a way, many different parts of the world are developing in rather similar ways. Um, there's a guy named Victor Lieberman. He doesn't work on military stuff altogether, but he's uh, in Michigan now, and he's written this wonderful book called Strange Parallels. And he's looking at demographics and all, all sorts of other things, uh, commerce, uh, 
Um, anyway, uh, and he finds in this 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 just magisterial like two volume thing that there's all sorts of developments happening in parallel. These strange parallels are happening throughout the world. Um, what period does that cover? Uh, he covers, I think it's like 1400 to 1750 or so. Uh -huh. Yeah, so he, the early modern period, what we call the early modern. And this is a loaded term. Many people will say, well, you can't call it the early modern because modern is, well, anyway, there's all sorts of arguments about about that. But I think that he makes a good case for, for an early modern period around the world. Um, but so so one of the things that's coming out of this new work is the, is the dynamism in other places. The other thing that I think is just starting to... Um, to emerge and, and will take some time is to understand what really was unique about the West because there is a tendency among uh, world historians to say that you know until around 1800 um, China developed parts of Asia and developed parts of Europe were developing along very similar lines and, uh, and this goes against our sort of deep model or older model traditional model that says that Europe diverged quite early because of science and representative government and the Renaissance and things like that um, and so there's this tendency among world historians to say that that wasn't the case and that the develop, divergence came late, around 1800, and Europe maybe wasn't so unique until later. Um, and I think that the military developments allow us to see to what extent Europe was unusual and was unique in that period. Um, so uh, the, the, the ship and the Renaissance fortress are some, but also certain developments in gun, gun technology. and Basically, by by rigorously comparing developments in Europe with with this so far relatively unexamined mass of the world, mm -hmm. uh, we can really start to understand what made Europe unique, and it's really exciting because there were things that were unique and exciting and interesting about Europe that we that maybe are part of that traditional model, but that we couldn't really appreciate. And if we look at military that, technology, what might those be? Well, in terms of military technology, um, well, we were just just talking to a gentleman who uh, I, who assumed, I think, as many of us have, that the, that the Chinese uh, invented gunpowder, um, but they used it for, for fireworks. I and mean, this is a very common thing that, we, that I was taught in my school, you know, and they didn't use it in weapons. And well, what we find when we look is that they were using it in weapons right away. Like, they're humans, they're fighting right. other people, and, and that these weapons, so they had a lead for 500 years or so. They, were, they had the best gunpowder weapons in the world. And, the first, and when I say Chinese, uh, they were Chinese and their neighbors who were constantly fighting in this period in the nine hundreds. So, um, so yeah, this this sense of dynamism, I think. But then there, then at a certain point, Europe did start to diverge. And so the question is, when and why and how and and I have some theories about that, which I'll be talking about in my talk and writing about in my book, and we can talk about it here too if you like. Um, the, the the gentleman you referred to as Lieberman, his name is. Uh, that is right. Really the book. Strange parallels. Strange parallels. Yeah, Victor Lieberman. So he's sort of arguing uh, that all of humanity was kind of advancing along a broad front for several centuries, and you can see this around the world. Uh, well, of course, you're not him, but but I'm interested. What what does he think counts for that aspect of uh -huh. the kind of uniformity of advance? That's well. That's one of the interesting things. And I'll, I'll, let me say when he says. Uh, to say a little clearer what he says, um, he doesn't say that everyone was, but he's developed areas, so urbanized um, cores, right? Um, I think you could consider urbanized cores. And he looks at various places, Southeast Asia, Western Europe, um, Eastern Asia. He doesn't look so much at West Asia, but probably his conclusions would work there too. Um, so yeah, and they're developing, their, their populations are increasing, they're getting more commercialized, they're, yeah, various intellectual developments and cultural developments that are similar. So what accounts for it, though, this is one of the things where he's, um, I, and I think it's a, kind of the most interesting thing, but he's kind of speculating, too, because we don't know. First of all, just, just to point out that this was happening is something in itself. But why? One possibility is uh, for some of these parallels and why they kind of go, developments kind of go in parallel is climate. It seems that climate is a very important driver of uh, all sorts of things when we civilize we civilized humans right living in our groups we are very very caught up and tied up in the natural environment and so when the climate cools or warms as it has through history big big effects can be seen states fall when it when uh, when solar radiation decreases because of volcanoes or you know, solar cycle changes and uh and we see those parallels throughout but another thing he says which i think is just fascinating and 
and is also something that can raise uh, questions among uh, among people who think that everything should be. Well, I won't go into that. We can maybe edit that part out. Uh, but one of the things he says is uh, that there's a sort of steady accretion of knowledge. I mean, human knowledge and culture is cumulative as long as you keep it up and write about it, right? And, 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 and bureaucratic techniques and administrative techniques, each time a state fails, the traditions, the, the institutions, the practices can go on to fertilize the next one. And so we, human beings get, in a way, better at, at keeping states together because he's really interested in, mm -hmm. in the cohesion and, and, uh, uh, and fluorescence of states. Um, so yeah, just the, just the gradual accumulation of, of knowledge and practice. Reminds me a little bit of a speaker we had here last year, Ian uh -huh. Morris, uh -huh. who made the same kind of arguments. Human beings learn how to solve problems. The solutions tend to be retained uh -huh. uh, and communicated, and, and hence you can see a general process of, of advance. Yeah. So sort of, sort of the same kind of uh, overall thesis. Um, so what are you up to now? But uh, what is your next project? Well, the next the book that I'm working on now is called The Gunpowder Age. And as I wrote Lost Colony, I, I just became fascinated by Chinese military history, which I, I really hadn't known much about. So how did the Chinese get so good at drill, for example, that they were able to outmaneuver the, the Dutch on so many occasions? How did they have this, this amazing tradition of leadership? But they, they're constantly, the Chinese sources are constantly citing um, Swins the you know art of war and other other sort of ancient texts and and they're really smart like the way that they apply this um, and I, I just became fascinated in Chinese military history and in, in the questions that I had raised in the book Lost Colony that's just one little episode right um, so I wanted to kind of widen the scope and so this this book looks at it's called the Gunpowder Age and it goes from about the invention of gunpowder 800s or 900 all the way till I just kind of arbitrarily decided that I wouldn't look at not black powder, right? So to the end of the 19th century when black powder was, was uh, replaced by smokeless powder. I just looked at the long term comparing um, Europe and, uh, and primarily China, but also other parts of the and, and that's what you'll be talking about later today yes, in the right. lecture. So uh, take a look at the lecture as well. Uh, and we'll have all of this laid out. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>